Isn't it time you got to know your technology leaders on a very real level? Welcome to our monthly podcast series. You're listening to Off the Record with GTRA, and I'm your host, Kelly Yoko. So grab your coffee or cocktail and join us for a casual yet intimate and thought-provoking expose on our top council members, ambassadors, technology innovators, and thought leaders. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I am very excited about a special guest, a colleague, personal friend of GTRA family, and I would uh, really like us to welcome Daryl Peake, cybersecurity expert from Department of Homeland Security. We'll be talking about cyber, continuous monitoring, cloud, and information sharing. Welcome, Daryl. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Glad to be here. <laughs> So before we get down to business, we all want to know a little bit more about you and your unique story. And, you know, one of the things I really appreciate about you is your passion for reading and always having a great book recommendation. So, you know, who is Daryl? Let's talk about you. Okay. Well, my name is Daryl Peake. I am originally from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I am a huge fan of all Philly teams, so that is something that I'm extremely passionate about. I went to the University of Pittsburgh, studied computer engineering, uh, got my master's from Penn State University in systems engineering. So primarily a lot of my uh, early career was associated to being very technically focused. I worked for Lockheed for nearly 10 years as a systems engineer, a system tester, as well as a system integrator for satellite systems, which made it a very uh, interesting endeavor. Um, Most recently coming to the D.C. area, I have been doing more independent verification and validation efforts as well as quality assurance. However, a lot of my specialty has been around the information assurance and cybersecurity area, so focusing on more the policy and strategic aspects of security as well as understanding a lot of the legislation that is currently out. So when I talk about certain areas, I'm trying to connect not only the technical aspects of networks and infrastructure, but also how that relates to legislation that's currently out. Uh, One of the things that I often say is that people tend to lean on moving away from compliance. That's been a discussion that I've heard in a couple of different forums. However, compliance is a start. It establishes the baseline, and what we need to do is innovate on top of the baseline that is established. Mm. Well, you know, I know you uh, you have a lot of interests that are pretty broad, but, you know, one of the interesting things you and I were just chatting about the other day was, you know, your interest in exploring randomness and, and the book you read on, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's called The uh, the Black Swan by Ms. Nicholas Philippe and um, the million things spent on vulnerabilities, uh, how there's little awareness about what actually happened. So let's, let's talk a little bit about your passion about that randomness. <laughs> right. Well, one of the things around cybersecurity that I am currently researching is the ability to better quantify how we look at cyber. Right now, measures of success are differing amongst various organizations, and in order to have a standard message or a standard measure of success, we have to look at some of the things that we can account for, but some of the things that we cannot necessarily account for, the unknown unknown. And the book that was presented and, and The Black Swan really talked about the unknown unknown because not the, the, the known knowns are not necessarily as much the threat as the unknown unknown. And what is the saying? Well, it's the low uh, probability high impact event that could take place, right? The, the idea is that and the comfort that we have is that most cybersecurity events and incidents are non-kinetic. Right. When we talk about the potential for what a cybersecurity threat can do, well, they're taking accounts and they're taking credit card information, but, however, they have not weaponized cybersecurity yet. And that is the low-probability, high-impact event, because what happens when a critical infrastructure becomes weaponized? That's something that we are looking at and have to look far ahead because we do not want our benefits or our technology to actually be a threat against us. So looking at critical infrastructure, some of the controls that are in place, being able to address some of these unknown unknowns to reduce the overall risk, but also the models that are used so that we do not become so rigid and so standardized that everybody knows our move already, 
right? Yeah. It's almost like a, a, a match or a boxing match where everybody knows that the right hook is coming. Go prepare for the right hook. But we have to make sure we diversify in certain areas to show that there is a decentralized model that is not easily um, accounted for, therefore creating certain aspects of randomness. Absolutely. Well, and you know, one of the other things that, um, you know, is, is a critical part of that is that the impact um, it's having on government, um, legislation, and policy. Um, we talked a little bit about centralized and decentralized networks. Um, you're, you're currently looking into some of those challenges and concerns. Do you think? So that's actually an excellent point. So the, the centralized and decentralized networks. Actually, I just read a book which uh, helped in, in kind of formulating some thoughts around this. Ori Braffin wrote a book called The Starfish and the Spider, in which he, the, the premise behind it was that the spider has one head and eight legs. Mm-hmm. So, therefore, it has multiple legs or multiple connections. However, if you kill the head, you kill the body. However, his example around the starfish is that the starfish has organs that are replicated in each leg. So, therefore, if you are impact one aspect or one leg of the starfish, it can still move. But the other aspect that really, really made it interesting to me was that if you the, the, the movement of a starfish is not dependent on one leg, but a negotiation of all legs on why it's important for us to go in a certain direction. But when I think about it, isn't that the way most organizations work, right? When you think about the human element of organizations and why we choose to make certain decisions, it's, it's essentially should be a, a decision that would benefit the whole. And that's a negotiation that is happening. So the way that I'm looking at the centralized versus decentralized efforts is the fact that our adversary is decentralized, mm-hmm. right? We don't know if there is a leader of a hacker organization, just like there is no leader of the Internet. However, having this kind of adversary, we have to have unique approaches in order to address it. And one of the uh, aspects of the the book talks about the hybrid model, where there can be certain elements that are decentralized, each department and agency having their own strategy in regards to cyber. However, there is a centralized model where you're doing the reporting and the information gathering and information sharing that people are greatly impacted or they can respond in a timely manner in order to reduce the overall uh, impact that can impact the uh, systemic uh, mm-hmm. total. Well, and, you know, there, you know, there's increasingly sophisticated, frequent, and disruptive you know, cyber attacks. You know, an attack on the critical infrastructure could be so significantly disruptive or potentially devastating. And, you know, policymakers on, uh, and cybersecurity ex- experts um, are saying that, you know, energy is one of the most vulnerable in the industries um, because a, a large-scale attack could temporarily alter, you know, a lot of the um, the you know, energy infrastructure, transportation, and it obviously would then have a huge impact on the economy, financial institutions, et cetera. So, you know, that's a bit about that, you know, unpredictable factor that you were talking about earlier. Right, right. And that's actually a great point is that we have so many different industries but often face the same challenges. But also there are significant parallels that can be leveraged in order to address cyber as a whole. Um, the parallel that I've been making lately is due to the idea of cloud, right? And, and mm-hmm. folks talk about cloud almost like they talk about hamburgers, like everybody enjoys the cloud. But one thing that <laughs> we are not doing is is creating a message that uh, helps people differentiate how the cloud is really set up and how it's structured to benefit the, the total, but also how to become a voice where the cloud service providers are actually able to respond to address the needs, uh, especially from a IT security perspective. So an example of that is um, one thing that I often say is that uh, cloud service providers are like property managers, right? You have a Mm -hmm. large facility and you want to bring on tenants. And based on the attractiveness of that particular facility, a tenant will come in and build out their own environment. Therefore, increasing the the capacity to suffice some of its membership or its organization, as well as bringing the tools and security in order to protect the intellectual property that is available inside that tenant area. Now, as a tenant of this particular environment or facility, you don't necessarily have to check on whether the electrical from the energy company is coming into the building. You're assuming that that's going to happen when you turn on the lights, and you're not 
thinking about the heater going out uh, in the basement because you are uh, trying to adjust the temperature or the thermostat in order to, uh, to uh, look at your area. And also, you're not looking at the water heater because when you turn on the faucet, you're expecting hot water. However, how much of that information should be conveyed to a, you as a tenant when you are only a 20-person organization in a 1,000-person facility? So it's mm-hmm. being able to be a collective voice through information sharing, but also be being able to create certain working groups to become a collective voice to increase the posture and address the benefits that could be uh, achieved with cloud. Good point. And that's where we have to have a call to action to move that forward. I mean, you know, the uh, current administration obviously thinks that it's a very critical, uh, important thing to factor into budget. I mean, uh, they uh, request a 20% increase in funding um, just for cybersecurity, but um, you know, the challenge is, is that, you know, cyber policy is so decentralized with authority shared among the White House and all of the executive departments that there are huge gaps in cyber policy that are, you know, leave vulnerabilities virtually unaddressed. So this is where, you know, we're seeing, you know, we, we're trying to, you know, talk to leaders and, and, and figure out a, a good way to help bridge that gap and, and move it forward. So good point. Well, yeah, and also it boils down to strategy. At right. the end of the day, we all should have a strategy in order to address these needs and these gaps that enhance or increase our ability to execute against the mission. Mm-hmm. The mission is should be what drives most organizations whatever their mission is, and the IT security aspect of that should supplement and enable an organization to meet that mission. And once the spending of dollars is so focused on IT security that IT, that the essential organizational mission isn't achieved, then there is a, a, a impact. Now, yeah. from a governmental aspect, we're not a profit base, but at the same time, appropriations are given to us based on our ability to meet the mission of our consumers, which are the, the, the nation. Mm-hmm. However, when you talk about a company who is now investing 30 to 40 percent of their um, capital into cybersecurity, and they are unable to execute against their mission and do the research and development that most government agencies benefit from, that becomes a problem in the conversation. So as far as the randomness, the, the one thing I believe that the measures of success need to be addressed and how do we translate that into the policies, right? So looking at it from a strategic perspective, you have strategic goals that you're trying to achieve, but at the same time, you have to measure against those goals to see if you're really successful and to see how you can even move that ticker a little bit further than it was from last year so that when you do have the unfortunate events where you become a target of an adversary that you're able to respond accordingly and that you can account for some of the quote unquote that I discussed earlier, compliance items or baseline items um, that should have been addressed. And one of the things that we discuss is that many of the the, the hacks that take place um, or the incidents that take place could have been avoided if there are standard controls that were put in place. Mm-hmm. But once again, we have the, the, the technical aspects of cybersecurity, but also you have the human element, and that is the thing that really drives the conversation. Well, how do we have a perfect blend between both? Yeah, well, and that and that's the truth. I mean, you can do all you can put all of the right technology in place to protect your virtual assets, but you know, when it comes down to the human factor. Um, you know, are they properly trained? And if they're not, obviously, in the security and IT departments, they're less conscientious of what they're what they're clicking on when it comes to phishing attacks, and think they can completely expose the network to vulnerabilities. And you know, one of the best analogies that you had for you know which which um, issues the government's facing, you were comparing cybersecurity, physical security, when discussing strategy, and you know, layers of defense and malicious actors and you're using this analogy, um, you had some interesting uh, points about how people who are not familiar with cybersecurity will quickly relate to it in their daily lives. Right. So um, I take the, the, the analogy of the, the townhouse development. Mm. And you have a row of townhouses, and essentially you have people 
who live in these townhouses who have their, their, their precious possessions within them, typically their families. Now, within these townhouses, you typically have some type of security in place, whether that security is a fence around the perimeter or it's a uh, alarm system that's within or it's a, uh, a weapon of choice to protect or even having a dog that is circling the perimeter, um, that is all layers of defense for your particular home strategy. That's a home strategy. That's what they're trying to do in order to keep themselves safe. But also, the owner accounts for the number of windows, the number of doors, the fact that the doors are open or closed. And in order to avoid the curious person who may just walk in because there's an open door or open window, but also the threat actor who is looking and who's, who's trying to observe who does not have those proper layers of defense in place. Now, the other element of this row house or these row houses is that there are, there are different service providers that are providing these security services. For instance, one has ADT, one has Ackerman, one has another. And in order to do that, that then creates more security because this is a decentralized model. And though you are all in the same row, you don't necessarily have to do the exact same thing. So therefore, we, we're, we're careful not to be so prescriptive that uh, a particular organization is not able to come up with their own strategy, but also to give them enough guidance in order to be able to implement and execute an effective strategy. Mm-hmm. Well, it definitely comes down to good leadership. That's, that's for sure. I mean, you know, how is government really going to create a fortress uh, against these, you know, malicious attacks and threats? you know, without the leaders, you know, being right on the forefront of, uh, you know, what, what's critical and, and how that's really important. And you mentioned, uh, you know, a very interesting hybrid approach being the best. Right. So the, the thing about the leader, and often I just use this quote today, is the speed of the leader is the speed of the pack. And essentially, being able to have strong leadership in place who understands the dynamic but also is able to talk to the technical side or the operational side as well as the business side is so critical with an organization because the discussion is moving much faster than anyone has earlier anticipated. So it's trying to be able to look at that perfect balance because there is certain aspects that are tool-related, but a tool cannot fix a broken process. Mm -hmm. So being able to address certain aspects that are not necessarily tool-related is called decision-making and being able to make decisions in a timely manner that can protect you from these particular incidents from taking place. But the other piece, this is a piece that I think is is also as, as critical, if not most critical, is the governance aspect and the accountability that's built in to the process, to the infrastructure, so that these actions can be dealt with in a proper manner. So when you talk about certain things as far as insider threat, well, insider threat is based on a number of policies that are in place, but just like laws are in place, which police officers have to address and identify, there's also the order piece of it where judgment needs to, be, needs to take place. So leadership really drives that conversation and how do we effectively make decisions once we have all the information in hand and being able to make timely decisions that are in the best interest of the organization, but also looking at the holistic body of work of the incident um, really helps in creating those effective decisions. Well, you know, that, that kind of leads me to one of my next questions, which is, you know, what do you feel are some of the most important security issues government leaders should be focused on in 2015? Well, one of the things is that we have a bunch of tools and a bunch of vendors and a, a bunch of great solutions. Actually, I'm, I'm very impressed with some of the solutions that I see out in the market. However, the effective implementation of these tools um, where you're not bombarding yourselves with too much, but you're doing something to streamline um, so that your organization can execute an effective strategy. But once again, putting the strategy in place, that is the start of every um, successful organization is creating that alignment to know what direction your organization is going, not only from a mission perspective, but also from an infrastructure or IT perspective. So being able to look at that information, um, understanding what legislation is out there to support organizations, 
And typically, the legislation that I'm looking at is is more geared towards the government. However, looking at the the, the legal aspects to to drive how you align and how you move forward um, going towards from a traditional model of IT security to a continuous monitoring model is something that now changes the conversation when it comes to strategy. Mm -hmm. The other piece is being able to determine what information gathering is, how to gather the information, and then how to effectively share that information. One thing that I'm careful about when I have conversations with folks is not giving them more than what they need. Because if you give them too much, they may get bored with the conversation and meet, miss the meat of the conversation. But if you tell them not enough, then they may go blindly into a certain situation that they could have easily avoided. Okay. So being able to parse down and shrink wrap the conversation so that we are delivering information that organizations can respond to. Now, incident data is being tracked very well by the National Vulnerability Database, but there are other areas that we can look at both in the private sector and uh, government to address some of this information sharing. So strategy coupled with governance and accountability and also the information sharing piece actually creates a good start to an ecosystem that benefit, that the tools can really benefit your organization. So that's, I think, is a good start. And I would say that being able to identify these things earlier on and say, well, let's not try to wrap our arms around the world, but let's see what we can do effectively and how to reduce the overall impact to our systems. And with that being said, the performance measures. By being able to monetize cybersecurity from a perspective of what kind of risk are you willing to take within your organization, um, but also being able to say, well, how well are we doing based on the performance measures that we identified as part of our goals? Mm. So those are um, good, good elements to explore as part of that discussion. Yeah, well, your passion is absolutely infectious. I mean, I, I really... I really appreciate your your involvement. You know, you're a GTRA ambassador and uh, moderator of our upcoming GTRA council meeting for CIOs for a reason. So what I'd like to do, too, is um, let's get them thinking about what, you know, what are some of the discussions you want the federal CIOs to start thinking about and what to open it up to healthy, lively dialogue and debate. Well, the, the idea of performance measures, right, monetizing cybersecurity and being able to say, well, because of this investment, this is the right investment for our organization to properly be secured, and we're willing to accept the risk associated to that. So quantitative management is one of those areas that I like to, to see and explore, and especially when it comes to integrating certain solutions. There's a lot of data that's coming out of these solutions, but is it really showing its return on investment to your organization? Is it really giving you the benefit that you initially thought it would give? Because, like I said, there are a lot of great tools out there, but if it's not really returning that investment on the cybersecurity tool, and one incident could be very impactful, but what are some of the other aspects that you can look at? Well, let's, let's, take a converse, let's have a conversation about that. Secure enclaves, containerizing, being able to encrypt certain aspects of data so that even though a certain access point may have been breached, um, the data is incomprehensible. Mm -hmm. So looking at it from a perspective of not only what the system is doing, what the applications are doing, but how to protect the data levels, and those are going to be important conversations. I'm really excited to see what people are going to be talking about as far as how to address some of these areas and also looking at the governance model. And so, so on that same note, Daryl, you know, one of the topics that really ties into what you just said was, um, you know, one of the, the panel discussions we had is on optimizing the cloud, contracting, security, and the transitional considerations. So let's talk a little bit right now about uh, your thoughts on cloud. Cloud. Cloud, I believe, will be a very beneficial model. The reason I say that is for many large organizations, um, especially for cloud service providers and, and, and others, they're able to maintain the budget of operating their own private cloud and having a supplemental cloud in order to reduce certain cost impacts to the organization, but also to be in some of those security controls that they necessarily don't have the resources to uh, invest in at this time. Mm -hmm. But when you think about the small business, 
when you think about the smaller organizations, they don't necessarily have the big budgets of a cabinet level agency or of a, a Fortune 500 organization. So how do they increase their cybersecurity posture without necessarily making the same type of investment, if not more? And a good idea around that is to utilize a cloud solution because, once again, the reason why there are property management and, and large facilities with tenants is because the, the owner or the decision maker doesn't want to invest in the whole building. They just need a space in order to execute their work and to be a, a contributing factor to whatever mission they're, they're, they're performing. So being able to benefit from the cloud and look at it from a perspective of a tenancy and saying, well, out of this tenancy, I'm able to execute my mission without having to invest an overwhelming amount of our capital is a, is a great way to, to leverage the cloud. But also, let's talk about some of the solutions. There are some capabilities within cloud that help you containerize certain data that you want to protect as well as you can leverage certain encryption models, as well as optimizers that speed the transmission of network flow. And then you think about the, the, the location of data, right? When we talk about cloud and where the cloud resides and how it, where it is stored, where it is in transit, and where it is in use, being able to now create solutions that gives comfort to the user or gives comfort to the tenant that is very important. So I, I see a lot of great potential in cloud. Um, actually, I say that I, I prefer for when I talk to cloud service providers that we talk about cloud sophistication and what makes your facility different, right? What makes me want to be part of your particular cloud and be and utilize that tenancy versus going across the street? Because if everybody is offering the same things, the only thing that's different is the cost. But once we get to a discussion of cloud sophistication, it's much more than just cost that we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Well, and, you know, it, it's good to touch on, of course, you know, one additional thing that, that's really pressing, another panel that we have at the next council meeting, which is on big data and, you know, how to drive intelligent government through the effective and secure usage of data analytics. So, you know, what, what would you like people to uh, talk about and think about for this discussion? Well, big data is another one of those sexy terms that people talk about, and <laughs> they tend to say it without uh, giving it context. As far as from a, a perspective of data, being a data scientist and understanding what questions are you trying to address? Being an engineer, one thing that we often do is there are certain hypotheses that are made in order to address certain questions in the world. And big data actually helps us address some of those questions. Now, if we drive that back to what are some of our strategic focuses, what are we trying to create, remove, increase, or decrease in regards to our goals, and what is the data that we need in order to address the fact that we are doing these things within our mission are very important, and big data can definitely drive that conversation. Mm-hmm. But also, I've seen some remarkable things happen with big data as far as coming to solutions, not only from a law enforcement aspect, but also from a cybersecurity aspect, where they're able to pull from disparate sources and address them and address solutions in ways that we never could have imagined in a timely manner that is almost mind-boggling because people know what sources of data to grab from, how they how they mesh that data, and how they make it tangible for the business user. Because essentially, we don't want to create more satisfaction of data scientists, the fact that we are growing their portfolio of data. We want to be able to address the needs and concerns of the business user, but also the low probability of it. When we start looking at trends and looking at statistics of events and saying, well, what are some of the outliers that we need to address, but also what are some of the unexpected that are happening as a result of this trend? Big data actually gives us the ability to do that at such a large scale that it is definitely a, a benefit to many organizations, especially if you think about from a usership perspective. It's, it's just, uh, I think, a, a truly beneficial um, topic area, and I think that uh, those who are going to be talking about these specific areas can talk about the benefits that they're bringing not only to government but also the private sector. Mm-hmm. So I, I love I love talking about big data. It's one of my things that um, I think will really help toward the quantitative discussion. 
Excellent. Well, and I can't wait to see that uh, that discussion. It's definitely one of the biggest topics for sure at the next meeting. And, you know, last but not least is, uh, you know, um, innovations in mobile computing and BYOD. Obviously, we can talk all day long about all the security issues around that. Uh, you know, so, but what do you think are some of the most important things government should be looking at? Well, as far as BYOD, it's still one of those areas that is um, – still being explored. When you talk about privacy and, and how people are using certain devices and bringing their own device to work and actually falling under some of the policy that an organization has put in place around their intellectual property or just confidential information as a whole, that's going to be something that will be an involving discussion. Um, also, the, the idea that when we think about mobility, and just not only your phone, but also your tablets and things of that nature, and creating containers within that environment that helps you still do work but use your own device. There is certain cost-saving models that are in place that an uh, organization could truly benefit from it, but there are also still some concerns at the leadership level if this is a good approach to use and if the certain approaches should be leveraged because of the types of technologies, the speed of technologies, and being able to push out certain controls and specifications that that limit the, the potential for compromise. Well, as usual, it is always a pleasure speaking to you, Daryl. I thank you so much for your time. I know you're so busy, and I cannot wait for you know your uh, your lively discussions at uh, the next meeting. And, and hopefully, it'll be wonderful to have you back again on another podcast. As also maybe a uh, a co-host and get some of our other CIOs who are confirmed for the next meeting. I know we've got an excellent lineup. Uh, you know, everyone from Rod Turk, with of Energy, John Cantor uh, from DHS, and you mm-hmm. know many others. So it'll be wonderful to uh, to have you kind of read some of the discussion. So thank you very much. You are very welcome. I always enjoy discussions, especially working with GCRA. So it, it's been a great time, and I'm looking forward to doing much more. Wonderful. Thank you, Daryl. You are welcome. Tune in for our next monthly Third Thursday podcast series, Off the Record with GTRA. Make sure you save the date for our GTRA Health Tech Council Summit, June 28th through 30th in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, as well as our fifth annual Converse Tech Awards, a recognition for technology leaders and innovators from government, healthcare, finance, and energy. Remember to nominate your peers and attend the Black Tie Awards Gala, where we announce the winners in a very exciting and dramatic envelope opening Oscar style. Also, be sure to save the date for our fall SecureGov and Secure Health Council Summit, November 15th through 17th at the Homestead Resort in Virginia. Again, I'm your host, Kelly Yoko, and I look forward to your topic ideas, feedback, and suggested podcast participants. So feel free to reach out to me directly at kellyy at gtra.org. 